Good day, everybody, and welcome to another edition of the Military and Foreign Affairs Network. I am your host, the Voice of Reason. Today we are now in day 37 of the ongoing war between the Russian Federation and Ukraine, and I've started uh, today's episode uh, actually uh, fairly deep, 20 miles or so inside of the Russian Federation, uh, in the, uh, the the fairly large city of uh, Belgorod. And the reason we're starting there is that uh, there has been a report within the last 24 hours that uh, a uh, Ukrainian uh, helicopter, rather two Ukrainian helicopter gunships, uh, have attacked a oil installation about 20 miles inside of the uh, of the city of uh, Belgorod, and there you can see the installation that was allegedly attacked by the by these uh, uh, helicopters fi uh, firing rockets uh, into uh, this facility, and it has set it on fire. Now, we've received reports that it, these two aircraft could be uh, MI-24 Hinds, but for that matter, they, they could also be MI-17s as well. And I'll try to explain why this is something that is really not outside the realm of possibility and really shouldn't uh, surprise the viewer that the uh, Ukrainians were, were able to, to pull this off. Again, not a, uh, a monolithic feat. Uh, in terms of, uh, of, of military operations. But again, uh, it, it did make the news, and, and, uh, and obviously uh, it uh, causes concern both inside of Russia, probably inside the city of uh, Belgorod, uh, and, uh, and, and gives a bit of a morale boost to Ukrainian forces who are uh, continuing to, to fight the, uh, the, the Russians, uh, obviously, as we speak. So again, uh, the Ukrainians control uh, fairly significant areas uh, in and around, obviously, the, the, the major city of uh, Kharkiv. Uh, they control uh, areas uh, to the northeast of, uh, of Kharkiv and to the west of Kharkiv. And we understand in all likelihood that the helicopters uh, initiate it uh, probably someplace within the vicinity of uh, Kharkiv and uh, then proceed it to their target inside of Belgorod, probably crushing, crossing the Russian border, uh, somewhere probably where my, where my cursor is, is circling. Now, so the question is, is why, why didn't the Russian uh, air defense assets shoot these helicopters down as they crossed the Russian border? Well, there's an explanation for that as well. The, uh, the helicopters were f flying very, very low, so again, very difficult to pick these, these uh, helicopters up on radar. They were probably flying at just about treetop level, uh, quite possibly uh, at night, uh, using uh, night vision equipment, quite possibly provided by Western nation, i.e. NATO, United States, United Kingdom, Poland, what have you. And again, flying at treetop level, very difficult to pick up on any sort of, uh, of, of radar across the Russian border. And again, these in all likelihood are either uh, MI-24 Hinds or uh, MI-17s, MI-8s, what have you, with, uh, with rocket pods on them. And uh, once they crossed the Russian border, the only thing that could really engage them at that point would have been Russian uh, uh, ground-to-air assets, uh, short-range assets uh, that that could have shot down these helicopters. And the problem with that is that once these helicopters crossed into Russia proper, it's highly likely that even Russian forces probably thought that these helicopters uh, were were Russian helicopters. Again, the uh, uh, Russia uh, does not appear to be operating a very effective. Uh, friend or foe uh, identification system, uh, much like uh, obviously the, the the NATO forces operate uh, Link 16, and uh, we we have information that in fact uh, even Ukrainian forces are using a version of Link 16 or Link 22 uh, to uh, uh, in their continued operations against the Russians. So, uh, if the Russians don't have that, then then obviously very very difficult uh, to identify these these uh, these helicopters. As uh, as enemy targets and then and engage them and then again even if they if they had that sort of system, uh, given that uh, the helicopters were flying very low, 
uh, at night, very hard to identify. Once they get into the rear area of Russian uh, of control, then in all likelihood, uh, some of those ground units within the Russian uh, army, the Russian ground forces, uh, Russian air defense forces, what have you, were probably very hesitant to engage those helicopters. Again, uh, probably uncertain whether, in fact, they were they were friend or foe. And uh, obviously, the Ukrainians took advantage of that, moved in, and attacked that uh, that oil installation, as you can see here on on our map. But again, as we speak, uh, it it was on fire. And uh, it, it appears to have been a fairly a successful attack. There doesn't appear to have been any any casualties, and we're not uh, certain what sort of military function uh, this facility would have been uh, utilized as. And again, I think it's it's more of a, a high plebiscite, plebiscity uh, boost for Ukrainian morale in terms of in terms of that attack. And again, it's not the first time that we've seen this occur. We've seen the Ukrainians strike down towards uh, uh, Rostov, and uh, we have seen a Russian airbase uh, near Rostov get hit by Ukrainian uh, ballistic missile fire. And uh, in fact, at least one, possibly two, uh, either SU-30s or SU-24s. Um, I'm sorry, SU-27s were uh, were destroyed on the ground by this Ukrainian uh, fire. But uh, again, uh, that's kind of making headlines right now. I don't think it's that uh, in terms of, of, of a military uh, success, probably uh, not that great. Now, can we look to see more of these types of raids by the Ukrainian military? Uh, again, quite possibly. Again, we're, we're talking uh, the fighting that is taking place is very, very, very close to the, uh, the border of the Russian Federation, and we're continuing to see more and more uh, Ukrainian counterattacks uh, against Russian forces within the confines of this conflict. So as you look at this map, the, the areas in the blue indicate uh, some sort of attack by Ukrainian forces. And uh, again, in the early stages of this conflict, we weren't seeing many, and now we're seeing uh, more and more. And obviously, uh, uh, no matter where you sit on this side of the conflict, well, especially if uh, you support the, uh, the Russian Federation, then obviously this should be uh, should be very very uh, concerning, uh, given the the uptick uh, in operations by the Ukrainian military in the form of some of these uh, these counterattacks. Now, I can tell you from reports coming out of the region that these uh, these operations by the Ukrainians, these counterattacks, uh, have been very very costly for the Ukrainians. Uh, in a lot of instances, they have uh, moved in against the Russians on the ground. And uh, at times have, have suffered very much like the Russians have suffered in, in some of its operations uh, against the Ukrainians, where the uh, Ukrainians were on the defensive. And again, um, that's just the nature of war, and it's kind of what we're, what we're seeing within the confines of this conflict. Uh, we continue to see very, very heavy shelling uh, near uh, Kiev, and both to the, to the northwest and to the east. We continue to see the Ukrainians attempt... Uh, to uh, to cut off Russian forces again near the uh, Anantov uh, Air Base and again uh, the the situation uh, right now for the uh, Russians uh, at least in the area north northwest of Kiev uh, is is fairly precarious right now we do understand that in some of these instances where the uh, Ukrainians have attacked the Ukrainians have suffered uh, some fairly significant casualties and have stopped some of those attacks. But as of right now, this is relatively indicative of, of what the situation looks like on the ground. Uh, again, uh, as the Russians chose to uh, back out some of those forces, obviously the Ukrainians took advantage of that transition of forces uh, to then uh, launch these operations near Kiev. And you can clearly see that uh, it has been uh, somewhat successful. Obviously, the goal uh, has was for the Ukrainians, at least, to uh, cut off Hostomel, cut off the uh, Antonov uh, air base, and uh, isolate Russian forces there, possibly uh, envelop them, circumvent them, and, and quite possibly look to attack and destroy Russian forces. Now, they haven't been able to do that. Russians uh, still control supply lines leading to both uh, the areas near Hostomel and the uh, 
uh, Anatofa Air Base. And uh, again, uh, obviously, the, the fighting continues. We've also seen the Ukrainians make headway al along the just al the, uh, the west bank of the Dnieper River in terms of its push directly north towards Chernobyl along this bank of the, uh, of the Dnieper River. Uh, but again, fighting continues. We're seeing just incredibly intense Russian artillery fire targeting uh, a lot of these uh, uh, Ukrainian uh, offensive operations. We're seeing the Russians uh, 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 quite heavily targeting some of these, uh, these, these urban areas just outside of Kiev as well in a very, very intense manner. Uh, but uh, the fighting continues. The situation is not yet resolved. And, uh, and obviously, we're, we're watching it very, very, very closely, especially uh, what's happening near uh, uh, Antonov uh, Airfield uh, and the environments uh, near there as well. Uh, again, uh, we continue to hear about fighting near Chernihiv. It doesn't appear the Russians are, are at least uh, attempting to back out of its uh, uh, holdings on the east bank of the Dnieper River, but with that being said, the Ukrainians are continuing to uh, uh, tenaciously both defend and, uh, in some cases, trying to retake uh, ground from the Russian forces, again, as you can see here on the map, and I think this map does a relatively uh, good job at uh, indicating what is, what is, what is happening uh, on the ground. Uh, in, in terms of uh, other areas of operations, obviously we continue to see very heavy fighting. Uh, along the line of contact in both the uh, near the uh, separatist areas of Luhansk and Donetsk, uh, and we continue to see fighting uh, inside of uh, of Mariupol. Again, uh, as I had talked about in the last two videos, we we now suspect that uh, this could go on for for quite some time uh, in terms of the Ukrainian forces that are inside of uh, of Mariupol. Now, obviously, there there are other maps that exist that indicate that. The Russians control more areas of Mariupol. Again, very difficult to to say at this point. Uh, I think this is 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 relatively correct, but at the same time, uh, there are probably areas uh, within the confines of of this display that the Russians do control, and uh, quite possibly it it, it kind of goes it goes back and forth with. And that's the nature of, of urban combat, where you can take an area and then quickly, because uh, again, with urban combat, you're looking at 360 degrees, uh, both on ground level and in the vertical as well, in terms of some of these uh, some of these buildings that uh, the uh, Ukrainians are defending, and, and obviously the Russians uh, could be also defending at some point as well. So again, very 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 nasty fight happening here in uh, in Mariupol. Uh, and again, uh, the same goes uh, within the vicinity of uh, Kherson. It looks like that, again, as we had talked about prior, uh, that counterattack by the Ukrainian military uh, coming out of Mykolaiv towards Kherson was, uh, was deflected, blunted, and stopped by the Russian military. And uh, we understand that the uh, Ukrainians, uh, that uh, Ukrainian attack, uh, also uh, suffered some casualties as well by the Ukrainians in its effort to push towards uh, Kherson. And uh, we understand that the Russians still have a fairly good hold on Kherson and the areas outside of Kherson as well. And we anticipate that uh, the Russians are not going to give up the West Bank of the uh, Dnieper River without a, a hellacious fight. Uh, because again, if the Russians do uh, look to uh, seize the eastern half of Ukraine and then look at some point to possibly again move into the west. Uh, it, it's going to be very, very difficult to do if they give up uh, this area that they, they currently hold. Uh, in other news, we continue to see the west, especially the United Kingdom, providing uh, the Ukrainian military with uh, all sorts of equipment. We're, we're now hearing that uh, there is a very real possibility that um, the United Kingdom could be providing the Ukrainians or, in fact, may have provided uh, through uh, some clandestine activity uh, the Ukrainians with some very long-range uh, rocket artillery systems such as the uh, MLRS or the HIMARS. And again, uh, I had talked about the accuracy of uh, that uh, Ukrainian uh, missile attack on that Russian ship uh, 
on the port of uh, Berdyansk. And uh, while it is possible that uh, it was an indigenous or a, a former Soviet-made missile, a Tocha or other, uh, uh, quite possibly a, a cruise missile or a cruise missile that the Ukrainians uh, have uh, p possessed and quite possibly have uh, updated uh, and, uh, and, and made it more of a precision strike instrument, uh, that is always a possibility. Uh, at the same time, I would not rule out that uh, through covert means, some of these long-range uh, rockets, such as a, a ballistic ATACMS, may have been deployed by the Ukrainian military. And uh, right now, again, we're, we're hearing rumblings that uh, the United Kingdom could be uh, possibly uh, deploying that system uh, via uh, Ukrainian proxies into the conflict. And obviously, uh, there's a very, very large, porous border running from Poland uh, down through uh, Romania, which is the Carpathian Mountains, that these systems can make their way via either British intelligence with the support of the Romanians or the Poles to get these systems into Ukraine. Look, we're seeing it actively being done. We're seeing uh, active... Uh, U.S. systems such as a long-range early warning radar aircraft directly supporting the Ukrainian military in terms of intelligence. And, I, and again, I can't say how important this intel that the Ukrainians are getting from the West is helping the Ukrainian military. And in fact, it, it has so distressed the Russians, the Russians aren't even talking uh, to the United to its uh, uh, U.S. Uh, military counterparts. So if the uh, U.S. Joint Chiefs of Staffs attempts to reach out to its Russian counterparts, they are not talking. The Russians are pissed. And uh, look, rightfully so. I, I get it. I understand. And, and obviously, if I was the battlefield commander in charge of the uh, Russian operation in Ukraine, I would be pissed as well, given the nature of uh, the direct support by these NATO countries uh, in a in a, a, a non-NATO country that I'm attempting to wage war against. But that's what's happening. And uh, I guess the next question is, well, at some point, will it expand? It doesn't look like the Russians at this point are, are backing down. Obviously, uh, they are having uh, some successes. They are having uh, areas where they are not being successful. And we're seeing actual, uh, in some cases, uh, battlefield setbacks by the Russian military. But again, uh, at this point, I, I don't believe the Russians have any choice but to continue. Um, if, you, if you just look at cost versus benefit and the Russians do back out, well, they walk away with what would be articulated as a loss. At the same time, without any sort of political solution, the Ukrainians are going to rearm at a much greater rate than uh, they even are now. So uh, I, I get that, uh, you know, obviously the Russians are looking to, to de-arm and, and quote-unquote denazify the, the, uh, the Ukrainian state. But again, uh, and that was the initial war goal and war objective, but uh, they, they may have uh, caused a lot of material damage to the Ukrainian military. But uh, at the same time, if the Russians were to end this conflict, say today, the, look, the, the Ukrainians are just going to rearm and probably being in, in a better position uh, a year from now or two years from now maybe than, than where they are right now in terms of being able to uh, resist. So uh, this operation uh, by the Russians in the end would, would probably do more harm than good, again, in terms of cost versus benefit uh, along the principle of the operation. So... Uh, if the Russians back out and go back to their original borders, even if they go back and, and Ukraine accepts uh, the Crimea and Donetsk and Luhansk as, uh, as, as territories of the Russian Federation, the, uh, the concept is going to be the same. The Ukrainians are going to rearm, and uh, the, uh, uh, one of the reasons why the Russian launched this operation, again, for in, in regards to strategic depth and out of concern that a, uh, a hostile nation could just be a few hundred kilometers from, uh, from Moscow with no real uh, defensive terrain barriers, 
uh, preventing it from at some point if if hostilities were to recommence maybe against uh NATO or, or what have you. You just don't know what's going to happen in the future. And that was one of the reasons articulated by the Russian forces uh, in this, uh, this, this ongoing operation. So I hope that makes you, the viewer, understand why it's very difficult for the Russians to just stop the operation right now. They have to get to a point where uh, they control quite possibly significantly more territory, especially in the east. Uh, I would say this may not be entirely successful unless the Russians uh, control all territory east of the Dnieper River and at least give the Russians the capacity to uh, have a key terrain feature, which is the uh, Dnieper River, uh, quite literally separating east versus west, if that, if that makes sense, as we uh, head into this, this new Cold War. And make no mistake of it, we are heading towards a, a very, very cold, frigid, new Cold War, and that's going to look like China and Russia and some other uh, satellite states uh, against the West, and that's just unfortunately uh, where we're at right now and where we're, where we're heading. But uh, again, uh, that is, uh, that's where we're at right now, and uh, we'll continue to monitor and report on as we get uh, information. Obviously, we had something come up yesterday, so we made another video. But again, thanks for joining us. I really, really appreciate it. And again, more content will be out very, very soon. Have a good day, everybody.